Hello, this is Daniel Meyer, pastor of First Baptist Church in River Falls, Wisconsin. It's great to have you all tuning in this morning. I hope that these next few minutes are a blessing to all of you and that you hear from God as I relay this message that he has given to me to give to you. Heidi. We are in our study of the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter number one. That's where we still are, Ecclesiastes chapter number one, the backslidden preacher. It's interesting. As you study the Bible, you learn a lot. And I was reading Proverbs this morning. And I was reviewing my notes from Proverbs and noticed that it's been said of Solomon that he was the master of sentences. Right? That sentence is a combination of words which is complete as expressing thought and writing it as marked at the close by a period or a full point. And boy, as we he's written here in Ecclesiastes, you can certainly you can certainly see that he's a master of sentences. It's been said that Solomon was a master of maxims. That's an established principle or preposition. A condensed preposition of importance and practical truth. And yet we had seen last week as we would looked at the backslidden preacher. We had seen, boy, there's a lot of maxims that we could draw from his behavior and from his precepts as he's writing and telling us about madness and folly. It's been said that Solomon was a master of axioms. An axiom is a self-evident or necessary truth or a preposition whose truth is so evident at first sight there's no reasoning or demonstration can make it any plainer and i believe we'll see that in just a minute we'll see the axioms that he lays forward here and it's also been said that solomon was a master of speeches meaning that he was a a special person he, he had this excellence and superiority when he when he spoke and i think we can see that when we go back and look at his his ministry especially early on when those i think of those two harlots that came with the the one with the dead child and boy his speech was so fitting so so harsh but yet so true right down the line when he asked for the sword and he could tell instantly who whose child it was solomon that we're we're talking about he says here in this in this passage ecclesiastes chapter one verse number four one generation passeth away and another generation cometh but the earth abideth forever the sun also ariseth and the sun goeth down and hasteth to his place where he arose the wind goeth toward the south and turneth about unto the north and it whirleth about continually and the wind returneth again according to his circuits all the rivers run into the sea yet the sea is not full why right, didn't i say he was a master of axioms and that's you don't need any explanation uh, the mighty mississippi just keeps piling water into the the gulf of mexico and the gulf of mexico has yet to overflow this idea that science would teach you that boy the sea levels are rising and that you can go back and look at photos of say miami and look at the same photo today in miami in the 20s and guess what the sea level is exactly the same and yet Solomon is telling us this thousands of years before science can ever figure it out. He says, and under the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. Boy, he's, he's laying out all these wonderful truths. Verse 8, all things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. Eye has not satisfied with seeing, nor ear filled with hearing. Eden said that the preacher here, is suggesting that if we take God away and we leave the creation, the creation no longer reflects God's glory. All it can illumine then is the weariness of mankind. This evening we're going to take a look at the, the law of circuits. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I ask that you'd help us as we open your word. We pray that you would teach us and guide us. Pray that you'd help us to have clarity of thought Lord, that we'd be able to see all these axioms, all these sentences, all these maxims that Solomon has laid forth. 
We recognize that he, he's writing this from a position of being backslidden, but at the same time, boy, look at all the truth that we can see. Help us to glean what you'd have for us here tonight. We ask this in your son's precious name, Jesus. Amen. Notice he, he, he puts an obvious answer there. He says, the earth abides forever. Wednesday night, we've been going through the book of Revelation, and we've seen where, boy, the earth was burnt up and the heavens were burnt up. And then he says there's a new earth and a new heaven. And yet here we see, boy, the earth abides forever. It abides forever based on the power of God. It abides forever because that's what God has decreed. Its face is renewed. Sometimes its face is renewed day by day. We can have a, a flood that comes through and it changes the landscape and it can stay that way for hundreds of years. And then a flood can come through again and change it in, in, in seconds. Out west, they've had some problems earlier this summer in the monsoon season. Some areas that never see any flooding, seen massive flooding because the, uh, the what do they call those, the washouts? They have washouts designed to catch all the rainwater and funnel it the right way. Well, one of them was blocked and that caused massive flooding five and six miles to the, to the south. Areas that shouldn't even seen water that way had rushing water come through and it changed the whole landscape, buried fences, moved, mo moved concrete things that you wouldn't even think of. That's the earth is renewed. The face is removed day by day. It'll be burnt and it becomes new. Solomon is referencing the, the cycle of life. We see the fact that, boy, one generation is here, another generation comes, the older generation just departs, and a newer generation comes. And he's talking about these eternal transits that exist in our world today. There's generations that come and go. Notice he says in verse 5, which I think he's, I think he's quoting Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show this handiwork talks about the the son running a race like the bridegroom i think he's i think he's quoting that past and hasted to his place where he rose the circuit of the sun it happens every day it doesn't stop it'll happen tomorrow just like it happened today the sun's gonna follow its its course the wind is the same you know it took science thousands of years to verify what solomon is writing here a little little over 1000 bc a little before 1000 bc the circuit right the closed loop that it follows over and over the sun follows that that loop the wind follow that loop generation after generation follow that loop he's he's detailing some some very very important things that we need to make sure that we recognize he says in verse number seven, he talks about the eternal circuits of the rivers. You ever wonder how the how that Mississippi has got so much water? I mean, it never stops. They've got locks on it and canals on it to slow and, and move some water so they can run some ships and make some power and control some flooding. But that thing doesn't stop. Where, where does the water come from? God's got an interesting cycle that he's, he's created. It's, a, it's an ecosystem. The moisture in the clouds, they produce rain, which feeds the brooks and the streams, which feeds the river, which feeds the oceans. It's then evaporated and it goes back up into the clouds and it starts over again. Solomon is detailing that. And I'm telling you, it's taken them, it's taken scientists over 3,000 years to figure it out. They recently, probably in my lifetime, they, they just figured out in the oceans, there's a current cycle that, that, that flows through. And so all that water flows all the way around. They, they, can, they can track it. And it's, got, it's got a course. Exactly like the wind that Solomon is talking about here. Exactly like the water that he's talking about here. So when you're reading your Bible... And, and you read something that, say, science hasn't, hasn't approved yet or hasn't agreed with yet, just wait. Because eventually science will come right in line with what the Bible says. Solomon got this from God. A circuit, of course, is a, is a closed loop. Doesn't necessarily have to be a circle. 
It's a closed loop. We have electric wires that run in this building. You know what they make? They make a circuit. They're not always round. Sometimes they go up over in a straight line and then back. It's a closed loop. And that's what Solomon's talking about. He's talking about this system that God has designed, the system that God has made for our world. And yet, if we were to think about the things that we get from God, they follow exactly this same path. Grace flows the same way. Grace is not withheld because of demerits. We, we have access to grace, the grace of God. Grace cannot be lessened because of demerits. Grace cannot be incurred because of debt. Right? And debt won't, debt won't cause God to shut off the, the power. Aren't you glad that we don't have the system where we're, we, we've got to make sure that we're, we're current on our, on our billing cycle with God? Otherwise, he's going to send out an angel and he's going to have this lockbox and he's going to clamp down and break that circuit and shut off the grace of God? No, he doesn't do that. Grace is not exercised the just payment of debt. Grace is never an overpayment on debt. Grace does not appear in the immediate divine dealings with sin. Grace does not appear in the immediate divine dealings with the sins of the saved. And yet, we, as we look at grace that flows from God, it's going to follow this exact circuit. All of these things start and originated with God. God set them in motion. God allows them to, to, to keep moving. You imagine that energy that moves that wind. Where would it come from? I mean, just where to come from, where to go. Always continues. And so God has established these, these circuits in our natural world. And yet spiritually, there's a circuit that runs that flows from God. It's the law of the circuit. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. By far one of my favorite books. 2 Corinthians. What a great book. Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. He says here in verse number 8, 2 Corinthians 9, verse number 8, And God was able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always have all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Notice in this law of circuits that comes from God, notice that first of all the source is what? Just like Solomon was talking about with the water and the wind, the source here is inexhaustible. Inexhaustible. God is an inexhaustible source of grace that flows from Him. We can come to God again and again and again and again. And you know what we find out? We find out that that fountain is never lessened. It's never low. It's never on empty. It's not been changed. It's always full. It's always available. It's always there for us. We can keep drawing from that fountain. That source is inexhaustible. The idea that someone would suppose that it would run out. You thinking that the sea is going to lessen by a cup. You ever go to the to the. We're, we're Christians, so we, we don't go to the beach. We go to the coast. You ever go to the coast and get wet? And then dry off and that water has been taken out of the, the sea, but the level never changes. Those giant waves slap the, the shore and it never lessens its size. Just like God. We can continue to draw from God is an inexhaustible source and that we always can have that grace. It's always available. It will always suffice and it suffices in everything. It's inexhaustible. If you, if you just thought about all the water that flows from northern Minnesota all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico all the time and wonder where does that water come from? And it never runs out. And the Gulf of the Mexico, Gulf of Mexico, what feeds the feeds right into the Atlantic, and it never runs out. 
Never hear him down there saying, boy, boy, that thing, well, we're 15 feet below or we're 15 feet above normal. They never say that. They never say that. If anything, they've got a problem with all the sediment that's been run down into the Gulf of Mexico and they've got to keep dredging it to make sure that the ships get through there. So don't buy this idea that we have that problem because we don't. But with God, we have an inexhaustible source of grace. Secondly, notice he says here, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you that ye always have all sufficiency. Always. Always. There's not a moment that it's shut off. There's not a moment that the circuit stops flowing. Right? There's not a fuse that pops and you've got to figure out how do I get that fuse back in there? What happened to the grace? Is the switch bad? We don't have that problem. It's right there. It's moment by moment, the quiet of the night and the hustle and bustle of the day while we're doing our due diligence and our duties, whether we're, whether we're faced with fellowship and friendship or the enemy is encamped at the very walls and the very gates. You know what? Grace is still available. It's always available. Always. Not only is it always available, but he says it with all sufficiency. That means it's perfectly capable to meet any and all emergencies. Any and all emergencies. Did you know that? I hope that you did. This sufficiency is independent of natural resources. Right? It's not going to be naturally filled. It's flowing from God. Maybe you've seen no better than in Acts chapter number 4. Turn to Acts chapter 4 for just a minute. I'll show you the sufficiency of that grace. Jesus Christ taught his disciples to not think about what you'd need to say in a moment. He'd give you exactly what to say. So I was talking on the radio this morning about people being unlearned. The Bible is super simple. And yet we have this sufficiency that flows from God that gives us the grace to be able to comfort us, to be able to help us in a time of need. Here we see in Acts chapter 4, we see John and Peter having been arrested in front of the, the mighty Sanhedrin, the mighty Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious rulers of the day, the learned men, the scholars, they're all there. And just watch what happens. Just watch the sufficiency of the, the grace of God flow through here. Verse number eight. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, he is made whole. Remember in Acts chapter three, Peter and John were going to the temple at the time of prayer and they met that impotent man that was there by the gate begging for alms. And Peter said, gold and silver, I have none, but what I have, I give in the name of Jesus Christ to rise and walk. And that, that impotent man was up jumping around. Now they're being, at, now they're being really interrogated for that miracle that took place. Peter just said, boy, that's a good deed. This impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him, doth this man stand here before you whole. That means that that impotent man was standing right there. They knew that impotent man. Just like blind Bartimaeus and all the rest of the, those that were feeble that the religious crowd couldn't help. They knew him by name. They knew him. They, they talked to him. He'd been there a long time. He's standing there and they know he shouldn't be standing there. Peter's able to point right to him. He says, this is the stone which was set at naught of you of the builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now when Peter, now when they saw, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. 
You want to know what? That's the sufficiency of the grace of God. You might not know how to speak or what to say, but one day God will empower you to say exactly what he wants you to say. Exactly what someone needs to hear. That is the sufficiency of the grace of God. In the midst of all that, they think that Peter and John, a bunch of ignorant, unlearned fishermen, yet they had access to the sufficiency of God by the grace of God in that circuit, right? That circuit runs because they, they were saved. They spent time with God and he, he keeps feeding them and that grace keeps coming and that grace keeps coming and that grace keeps coming. Aren't you glad that we can all have that sufficiency? Aren't you glad that it never runs out? Aren't you glad that one day you could be just like them? Boy, and he just gives you the words to say and how to say them. I'm going to turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Notice not only do we have sufficiency, notice what he says. In all things. Always having all sufficiency in all things. That means that you'll know exactly how to talk to somebody who is troubled. You'll have divine wisdom that comes from God. You'll know how to tactfully say things. You'll have courage if danger is present. Did Peter not have courage? Peter was filled with courage. Peter just started talking. And of course, we didn't have time to finish Acts chapter number four, but they beat them and whipped them and told them not to preach. And they went away rejoicing, thankful that they were able to suffer for the cause of Christ. All things. Courage if danger is present. All long suffering with joyfulness and affliction. Even in that affliction, it tears at the heart. God is able to, to be there and, and comfort with the grace that only flows from him. Notice in all things may abound to every good work. To every good work. May abound. Our inexhaustible grace has now been filled where? To the brim. That cup is full. Makes a hibiscus. That's where, that's where it crowns over. Before it starts to overflow on the sides. Then it starts to overflow on the sides. And that means that the grace of God that follows in that circuit is able to help us. And we don't have to worry about our effort. We don't have to worry about our weariness. We don't have to worry about drawing from it. It's not a mechanical apparatus. It's the grace that fills the heart that naturally flows out on every side and then to every good work. All coming from God. As it is written, verse number nine, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteous remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both ministereth bread for your food and multiply your need sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Verse 11, being enriched in everything, right? That all sufficiency that flows, that, that it makes us abound is suddenly helping us to be what enriched by the glory of God because the grace of God that comes through to us. This is really just a repetition of what we had just seen about abounding. But it goes farther than that because there's a difference between the word sufficiency and a difference between the word enriched means more than the word sufficient. The former cup was filled, but now each additional drop that hits in that cup as that cup is overflowing is enriching. It is encouraging and is helping as it flows over on every side. And this overflowing process produces what? Gives us confidence, gives us encouragement. We talked about this in James chapter four, verse number six, but he giveth more grace. 
Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. He just keeps giving the grace of God. It just keeps coming. And as it comes, guess what? It helps us. It makes an encouragement to us. It teaches us, boy, that we have exceedingly great, precious promises that come from God as we minister to other people comforted us and helped us in a time of need, in a time of sorrow, in a time of sickness, in a time of health and happiness. Boy, just flowing from God. This is the circuit. And then it's not enough. Notice it says, and being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. To all. A bountiful stream that flows. That stream of grace is never stagnant. That stream of grace never flows into a stinking pond. Never flows into the Dead Sea. Always continues to produce life. Continues to flow and produce happiness and encouragement to all those that will receive it. It's never decay. It doesn't stink. It's not like the manna that was gathered extra trying to get through the day that produced worms. No, it produces a channel of blessings. This is the circuit that God has given to us. Solomon is talking about the natural realm, and yet he was connected to the, to the living God. In 1 Kings chapter number 3, his source of grace came from the fact that he was praying and talking to God. And he got the wisdom that came from God to be able to minister to a nation, to be able to build a temple, to be able to establish a kingdom. We have access to all of that through all sufficiency that flows from God. It's a circuit. And that circuit never stops. Solomon is talking about the, the natural realm. Because Solomon detached himself from the, that outpouring of God. When God comes to him the second time and basically gives him a warning and tells him, Boy, boy you keep going down this path. I'm paraphrasing. He's saying, boy, you keep going down this path. You're going you're gonna to cut me off and we're going to be all done and I'm not going to talk to you. Man, you know what happened? Solomon continued. And that circuit was broken. But God didn't break that circuit. Solomon broke that circuit. Solomon allowed sin to separate him between himself and God. And because he allowed that sin to get in there, that circuit was broken and that grace that he needed was forever Stifled. He didn't have it. We got lots of stuff on Solomon in the first 20 years of his ministry as king. The last 20 years, we got nothing. Nothing. God doesn't want us to be that way. God wants us to have this supply. God wants us to not only have it, but be thankful to him because we have access to it. He's trying to encourage us and trying to help us and equip us as he continues to give us that grace that we need. That grace helps you when you stub your toe. That grace helps you when your, your neighbor, your coworker, your friend is hurting, that you're able to give them those comforting words to be able to encourage them and help them. We, we have something that everybody else doesn't have. We ought to have something that puts a smile on our face. We ought to be able to encourage others by what God is doing in our lives. As we're, we're hooked to this. It's a circuit that flows. It's a circuit that helps. It's a circuit that encourages us. Go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Notice that the sun never toils. The sun never tires. The sun continues to follow that course. The wind never tires, the wind never toils, as it follows the course that God has established. The rivers run the same, the oceans run the same. And yet we as believers have access to all of those things. Notice he says, all things are full of labor. Our labors are what's supposed to abound more and more unto God. As God gives us the promises, as God gives us the grace. Boy, why? Because we've escaped the corruption that's in the world. We've escaped it. He's given us access to this grace. Our labors ought to be full of things for God. Man cannot utter it. Sometimes we can't utter. How, how do you know? How do you know what to do? How do you know what to say? We heard that testimony from that 
man that was hunting. He said he was struggling to maybe even stay awake, slumbering. And he said he felt prompted to the, the Lord to, to do something. And he did it and he was rewarded. You can't utter that. You can't, you can't describe all the things of God. Eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor ear filled with hearing. We're not always satisfied with seeing the miracles or hearing the miracles. But yet we have access to the God of miracles through the grace of God that's abounding and helping and, and trying to get us to live for him. Oh, it's the grace of God. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved. We have that grace. Once we have that grace, it continues to help us, to grow us, to stretch us, to encourage us, to continue to do more for him as we're connected and empowered by a holy God through a Holy Spirit, through a holy word, to live a righteous life that glorifies him, that's able to bring him the fruit as it pours out in our, our own life. Is that not Psalm 23? My cup runneth over? Just turn there, Psalm 23. I was going to quote it, but... Sometimes as a preacher, you get going and you get excited and then you think that you can quote it and you might quote it in your version, but your version's not, not good enough. My version's not good enough. Notice what he says there in verse number five. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. That's the grace of God. That's being connected to the living source that meets all of our needs. And as he meets our needs, it overflows and it runs on every side. We ought to be able to take that and continue to minister to those whose cup is empty, whose cup is not filling, whose cup is not connected, so that they can see something that we have that they don't have. As he concludes it, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. We talked about that this morning, about reading the word, spending time in the word, about meditating upon the word of God as it lengthens our days, as it feeds us and gives us those things that we need. Solomon's talking about these natural circuits. We're all not scientists. We're all not environmentalists. But we are Christians. We are believers. We have a copy of the word of God. We can take that same application of those natural systems that are existing and make the application spiritually that that's exactly what God wants in our lives. And I just showed you he's given that grace, all sufficiency as he pours it into us. Our job is to pour it out to others. Right? The sea's not full. The sea collects all that water and it's not overflowing. It evaporates up, given to the clouds, back to rain, starts the whole process over. God gives to us that grace. He feeds us and encourages us. We're supposed to take that little bit, give it out, and then watch him give it back to us. That cup's full, that cup's overflowing. The law of the circuits. I hope that you're connected to God. I hope that God is feeding you. I hope that God is supplying all the grace that you need and more so, because I assure you, your neighbors don't have it. Your coworker doesn't have it. You're unsaved antagonistic friend doesn't have it but he needs it needs to see it flow from you needs to see it overrun the sides all sufficiency the grace of god law of service let's pray father I ask that you'd help us as you continue to feed us with your grace lord that we might dispense it to others that we might be able to be an encouragement to others and help them help us to continue to dispense that grace to be dispenser dispensaries just as you flow and give it to us as we give it out to others in a time of need. Help us to be like John and Peter. Help us to be full of courage, though others might think that we're ignorant and unlearned, as you give us the right words to say at the right time, using divine wisdom and tact. We give you all the honor and all the glory. We ask that you take this and use it mightily. We ask this in your son's name, Jesus, amen. Thanks for coming out this evening. Look forward to seeing you Wednesday night, 7 p.m. God bless. Have a good evening. Don't forget to vote Tuesday. Make sure you vote and pray. God bless. We'll see you soon.